everybody, welcome back to my channel. If you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Caitlin Elliott, and today we're going to be talking about the unsolved murder of Rachel Marie Runyon. Now, Rachel, she was born on June 23rd of 1979 in the town of Ogden, Utah. And Ogden is a relatively average-sized town in Utah. It was about, it had about like 87,000 people in the year of 2020. So... Rachel, she was the middle child of Jeff and Elaine Runyon, and she had an older brother named Justin and a younger brother named Nathan. Originally, Rachel's family, they lived in Tennessee, but a year after her birth, Rachel, like Rachel's parents and her family, they decided that they were going to move to Sunset, Utah, because they felt like it was going to be a much safer place for the family to live, which, unfortunately, this decision would prove very wrong to the family. Rachel, she was the family's little princess. She was the only daughter, and she was an impeccably beautiful little girl who eventually, she ended up entering beauty pageants. And in fact, Rachel was actually crowned Little Miss Sunset back in 1981 at the age of two, which is incredible for that age. So, even though she was a pageant winner, Rachel, she, she was still a little girl, and she loved to play. In fact, her mother claimed that she was a very well-behaved child, who would watch her five-year-old brother Justin play while she would suck her thumb. And her mother used to tease her often that if she that she sucked her thumb so much that she would end up with buck teeth. And this always made Rachel laugh. Even though Sunset is a safe community, their parents constantly warned them about stranger danger, which ends up being a huge factor in this case. The family had actually decided to install a gate in their backyard to add more protection to their children. On August 26th of 1982, it was late in the morning, and three-year-old uh, Rachel and her brother Justin, they asked their parents if they could go and play at the elementary school, which was near their home. They even asked if they could bring their 18-month-old brother Nathan with them. There's actually a park that's right nearby their house, but for some reason they wanted to go to the elementary school. Their mother, Elaine, she initially hesitated to let them go because she doesn't, she normally, like, doesn't let them go to a park that isn't the one by her house. So, she was a little hesitant, but she allowed them to go this one time, which, unfortunately, this decision would end up being a fatal decision. The school wasn't too far from their home. It was only 15 feet away from their house, and Elaine could easily see her children outside playing. She would even regularly check up with them, check up with them and ask them how they were doing. And I'm not a parent, but I personally would not feel comfortable with my 5-year-old, 3-year-old and 1-year-old at a park by themselves. It just gives off like I don't know, it just makes me uncomfortable. Around 12:45 in the afternoon of August 26th, Rachel's mother, Elaine, she calls the children to come and get their lunch. And the three children, like I said, were over by themselves at the elementary school at the ages of five, three, and one. Elaine, she was shocked when the only people coming up for lunch were her two sons, Justin and Nathan. And they, like, were walking towards her and she couldn't see Rachel. She was like, she asked Justin, she was like, where's Rachel at? And he said that an African-American man had taken Rachel with him. And in fact, while Elaine wasn't looking, a man had approached all three children. And they, he had promised Rachel that he would get her bubblegum flavored ice cream, which was her favorite flavor of ice cream. The boys were told to come with the man as well. And they agreed and they started following him over to the car. But as they're heading that way, Justin starts to get a really uneasy feeling. And, I mean, like like I said, the man's telling them they, get the, they got the bubblegum ice cream in his car. Which is odd to say, because when would he have picked it up? Because he was sitting there watching them. And it's, the children live in Utah, and it can get really, really hot there. Especially in August. So even if he did have the ice cream in his car, he it would have been melted by the heat anyways. It was around this time, like, the eldest child, Justin, he started getting a really uneasy feeling about the man. And he began to tell Rachel they need to get away from the unknown man. He's like, look, this guy's making me super uncomfortable. I don't like that we're following him. 
we should probably go back to the park and play like our mother told us that we were able to do. Let's go back and play. And Rachel, she turned away from her brother and started to walk towards the man. And it was at this point that the unknown man grabbed Rachel and threw her into his car while she is just kicking and screaming and he drives off. Now Justin, he was just paralyzed in fear. He had he was just stunned. He didn't, like it happened so fast he wasn't able to understand what just actually happened. So like his little sister is just vanishing from sight and he was just scared out of his mind. So of course, you know, Justin, Nathan, they immediately go back to their home where their mother Elaine is sitting there waiting for them. And so he, Elaine starts asking, you know, where's Rachel at? Like, what's going on? Where's Rachel? She's still over playing. Like I told you, the guys to come back as a family. And Justin, he says that, you know, there was this man and, you know, like he took Rachel. So of course, Elaine being, you know, the protective mother that she is, she starts to panic as any of us would. She starts to panic and she immediately runs to the supermarket, which is where the abductor said that they were going to take, you know, the kids to. That's where he said he was going to take Rachel to get her bubblegum flavored ice cream. So he starts running over there like, oh my gosh, have you, like she starts going and asking if they've seen a little girl. Then so he, she starts saying, have you seen a little girl, a little three-year-old girl with a black man? And unfortunately... No one had seen them, which means his intentions were impure and he was not going to take Rachel and the kids to the store. Something more sinister was going on. So 20 minutes later after Rachel was abducted, Elaine Runyon, she ended up calling the Sunset Police. And luckily they had their own police department, which is convenient for a small town. But the police ended up, they ended up setting up roadblocks, which if you don't know what a roadblock is, it's basically, you know... A, um, the way the, they just, break, break, bleh, basically blocking off the road. And if anyone comes by, the police would basically question them. So it was, it was pretty, it was pretty good that like they asked all that too. So they set up all the roadblocks and everything. So it's, it was nice of them to be able to figure all that out. So it turns out, like, as they were trying to stop and find the car to save Rachel, it turned out to be a failure because they did not catch the abductor. And I can only imagine how frustrated her family must have been feeling from all this. Like, they're trying to get their daughter back and it just seems like nothing is going right. So, it turns out that not only was Justin and Nathan and Rachel approached by this man, but another 10-year-old boy who helped provide a description to the police of what this man looked like he was in this approached by him in the same exact park and he said that he was an african-american male he was between 30 to 35 years of age around six feet tall with a medium build an afro styled hair and a handlebar mustache and this same man was actually seen by a witness playing with rachel and her brothers before they, they started following this man so like this family the these witnesses have seen this man play with these kids, which is so creepy. Like you're a grown dude playing with little kids. Like what is wrong with you? So the same, like I said, he was seen by uh, the witnesses playing with Rachel. What are you doing? Stop. And unfortunately, like the park did not have any video cameras or anything to see what had actually happened and who had taken Rachel. So it was ex extremely frustrating that nobody was a witness minus Justin and the other, the other guy. So the Runyon family, they eventually started their own search party for Rachel, which included dozens of family members and dozens of neighbors. Everyone started doing what they could to help out. And whether it could be supporting the family or just helping look for Rachel, they were just doing what they could to help. There were thousands of flyers printed with Rachel's beautiful smiling face on it that were hung up on multiple posts in the area to help get the word out about um, 
you know, what happened to Rachel. And to help to get the word across to the nation, her parents, Jeff and Elaine, they went to the local news station and they had decided that they were going to inform the public of what had just happened. So they had flew to New York one week after her abduction and then they started saying if anybody knows like what had happened, they would give like a $20,000 reward for the return for Rachel and they even had stated to the abductor to please, please return. Like they were begging for her return. And unfortunately, this was not meant to be. On September 19th of 1982, a little less than a month after Rachel's abduction, a family was traveling down through the state of Utah for a family trip. And they had been traveling for quite some bit. And they were, they decided to pull off onto like a little mountain road, like 50 miles away from sunset to get out of the car and stretch their legs because they obviously had been in that car for quite a while. And so when they decided to do that, the couple, they had a bunch of children with them and the children asked if they could go play by the little creek. And so, you know, like they were kids, they were bored from the, um, the long ride so the parents they agreed as long as they were being safe so you know they want to skip some rocks in the creek and all that so like I said they agreed and the, the kids decided they were started skipping the stones and well one of the stones landed by what the kids believed to be a doll or a mannequin so they start to get to um, close enough to inspect it and they realized it wasn't a doll it was the nude body of a toddler a female toddler so they were horrified because not only that but the toddler's arms were bound behind her back so obviously you know this freaked the children out and they had decided to run over to their parents and tell them exactly what was happening and so you know they were they bring the parents back to look at the body of the child that they see and you know the parents obviously they freak out for good reason and they call the police so the police they arrived to the scene and they ended up getting in contact with where are you doing the runyans family and they bring the runyans down to where the creek was to positively identify this girl's body and unfortunately it was Rachel Marie Runyon. I can't even imagine how horrible like her like sweet Rachel's parents must have felt knowing that her they found their body the body of their daughter. Like that is just absolutely heart wrenching and just it's horrible. And no parent ever deserves to hear that. No parent ever deserves to get that call. And the coroner, they actually came to observe what the cause of death was. And it was stated to be concluded like an undetermined cause of death. Like, no, like they didn't know how she died. So, thank God the family did the right thing and called the authority, like the family that found her, and called the authorities right away before the body was too decomposed that they couldn't identify her. So, thank God they did that. So, Jeff and Elaine Runyon, they had to bury their three-year-old little girl at Sunset Stakes Center. And this, it was absolutely devastating funeral for the entire family and for the community as well. Everyone had done what they could to help find her and the end result was her life had been taken. I can only imagine. Her siblings now have to grow up without their sister and her parents have to grow up now without their little girl. And this murder, it had shook the town of Sunset, Utah to its core. Nobody felt safe. Her funeral was actually had over 300 people attending it. People that didn't even know the Runyon family. They still wanted to go and show their support to the family. Rachel, she was buried in a white casket with a photograph of her on top, along with a pink rosebud and her favorite Raggedy Ann doll. And when I read that, when I was doing my research, I burst into tears. It was just so heartbreaking. And on her grave, 
it had an, ex an inscription that said she brought a nation to its knees and that just makes it like all the more heartbreaking and awful so in october of 1982 a few months after rachel's murder there was a law that was passed in court that stated the parents of missing children were allowed access to a clearinghouse by the fbi and a clearinghouse is an organization that provides resources for families of missing children to it would help obtain over 300,000 utah children's fingerprints before like to help identify like possible Jane John does just help them find their children and the state of Utah also created the Rachel alert which is like today's Amber alert before Amber Hagerman was killed because she was killed in 1996 so there was only two times that this alert was ever used and it was in June of 2002 with the Elizabeth Smart case, which if you don't know about the Elizabeth Smart case, I will probably cover that in a later video. And it was also used for the th a kidnapping in 2003 of three month old Nicholas Triplett, both of whom were safely rescued. And the case went extremely cold for a very, very, very long time with zero leads soaring within a matter of years. There was no, there was nothing. So then a few years after she was murdered, there was a note that was found at a local laundromat. And this was by where Rachel was killed by, it was by the elementary school. And the note contained something that shocked everybody. It stated, beware, I'm still at large. I killed the Runyon girl. Remember, beware. And it had an upside down cross. And on each part, like that, it went 666. Six, six. And that's actually so scary. Actually, it's so scary. And there was actually a police lieutenant. His name was Phil Alms Olmstead who worked in the Sunset in the Sunset uh, Police Department and he was determined to solve the case because he felt like such a deep connection to it. This was a three-year-old pageant winning girl who was abducted and killed for what seemed like to be absolutely no reason at all. Not to mention that Phil was the first person that responded to the original 911 call. Phil, he decided to make a promise to himself that he would do whatever it would take to help this family solve the disappear the murder of their daughter. And so he wanted to help, like I said, he wanted to help close the case and bring an end to an ongoing murder mystery and help the family. So he had Rachel's body exhumed, which basically means they dug up her body and went through there for DNA testing. And this was back in 2007. And they put the DNA into a database and unfortunately there was zero matches. However, the Runyon family, they have never given up hope that it will one day be solved. There was a huge break in the case in the year of 2012 when there was an inmate in the Philadelphia prison and they, look, they were being looked into as a possible suspect for Rachel's murder. And this was hu a huge, big news. <laughs> Riley, huge, like huge big news because there had been no suspect that was publicly announced. So, like, everyone's starting to get excited and freaking out, you know? And this, this person actually ended up being a resident of Sunset back in the year of 1982. And possibly even knew Rachel because of her being a pageant winner. There's also, there was also a man in um, New Mexico. And he had a criminal record, and he was also being looked into as a suspect. And police had announced that they had evidence of the potential guilt of the suspect. But there wasn't, which, you know, potential guilt just proves that he may be guilty. But there wasn't enough evidence to actually do an arrest. Despite all of this, though, the police in Sunset, they named Ken... He was like the police chief. His name was Ken 
Eborn, and he was convinced that they were witnesses to the crime of what had happened to Rachel. And he's, he fears that they may not have be able to come forward because of death threats that the suspect had made towards them. And after what happened to Rachel, Elaine Runyon decided to turn her grief for her daughter into action and help prevent something from this like this ever ha from ever happening again. And she wanted to protect other families. She even had become a vocal advocate to help raise awareness about child safety and child abduction because unfortunately there are people out there who want to take your children and kill them unfortunately sometimes. And you know, it there's sick people out there. There's sick people everywhere. Elaine, she even helped out put like help push out laws to put in procedures about recovering a stolen child. So in May of 2016, the park by the Runyon Childhood Home, it was, you know, where um, Rachel was abducted from, it was renamed the Rachel Runyon Memorial Park. And there's a memorial stone by the entrance that reads, in honor of Rachel Marie Runyon, June 23rd, 1979 to August 26th of 1982 abducted from Doxley Elementary Playground, August 26, 1982. Now I'm going to talk about my thoughts, opinions, and theories on this case, because of course I believe that anyone who, like, does this to children are pieces of shit, and I will say that they're pieces of human filth. They are pieces of human shit. They're terrible. It's disgusting. And it's a sad thing when a three-year-old child can't even play with her brothers because someone has to come and prey on her. And, you know, it's preyed on by a predator. And anyone who does crimes against children, I personally believe that they deserve to die in the most painful, painful way ever. So, that's my opinion too. So, one of the biggest theories and opinions that I have about what happened to Rachel was that she was possibly a target for a satanic cult. The reason why I have that belief is because of... The note that was left behind. The note that was left behind had an upside down cross and it said, remember, 666. And that is considered to be Satan's number. And a lot of children's sacrifices were actually done in parts of um, satanic groups. Because, and it's it was done in order to please a being, a deity, or a tribal group. And such an example like, such in this, this example, it had to have been Satan. Stop chewing on stuff. And to be, to be a sacrifice, a child doesn't have to honestly be brutally murdered. It just has, a child will just have to be killed in, in order to please Satan. And I'm not saying at all that I agree with any of this. I think it's ridiculous. I'm just stating the facts of what I believe happened. And it's quite possible that the man was sent to find a perfect specimen, if you will. And he found the three children. And he tried to lure away all three, because, you know, three is the devil's number. You know, three, six, six, six. And he was only able to secure Rachel. And the sacrifice could have been done in a way that had that could have been, like, extremely difficult to know what could have happened to her. And, yeah, so I, I actually want to bring in something that I personally remember witnessing or being told as a child. So where I grew up, there was an old church and it had burned down like years ago, but it was said that the old church was a ground for pagan sacrifices and where they would do ritualistic sacrifices to children and to please like, Satan, like I said. So when I thought of the upside down cross with the 666 and how they targeted the ch like the children, and then it, it connected to me with what I had witnessed from being told by my mother. And so, you know, I started putting two and two together and I was like, oh my God, that makes sense. So, as always, I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions down below in the comment section. And please make sure that they are respectful because you don't know 
who is going to be watching this video. It could have been, could be Rachel's family. It could be friends. You never know who could be watching this. So please make sure your comments are respectful and make sure that you like, subscribe, and try to request any type of videos that you possibly can because like that you would like me to cover because like I said, I post on Tuesdays and Fridays, True Crime Tuesdays and then Crimes of the Times. So thank you all so, 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 so much for listening to this story. And I do hope that one day that this case will be solved and help put closure towards the family. And I would love to know what you guys think about my theories about possibly being a um, satanic sacrifice like Rachel's death being a satanic sacrifice and the, that's why they prayed on the children and with the 666 and everything that could, that was left behind in that note and I would like to know if you think that that's true that's not true like I just want to know what your guys' opinions are like I said please make sure everything's respectful in the comments below I will delete them if otherwise but I can't wait to see you guys in my next video bye guys